there we go. We are recording the Rex call, the Rex monthly check-in call for September of 2018 on September 12th, which is a Wednesday. Uh, and I have a poem to take us in, which if I can find it is by Kay Ryan, one of my favorite poets, and is titled, A Ball Rolls on a Point. A Ball Rolls on a Point by Kay Ryan. The whole ball of who we are presses into the green bays at a single tiny spot, an oral crackle, an oral track of crackle betrays our passage through the fibrous jungle. It's hot and desperate. Insects spring out of it. The pressure is intense in the sense that we've lost proportion, as though bringing too much to bear too locally were our decision. Here's the link to the poem. Let me read it again. <clears throat> a Ball Rolls on a Point by K. Ryan. The whole ball of who we are presses into the green bays at a single tiny spot. An oral track of crackle betrays our passage through the fibrous jungle. It's hot and desperate. Insects spring out of it. The pressure is intense and the sense that we've lost proportion, as though bringing too much to bear too locally were our decisions. Richard, great to see you as well. This is lovely. Excuse me, I'm not seeing anything. Is like anybody or anything? Anybody or anything. It just says launching, launching, and I can hear you. We see you very nicely. You're, you're, you're square oh. at, your, at your dining table, I think. Yeah. I think if you are, look at a different window, so the yes. launching window is in your browser. Yes. Yeah. There's a, a different browser. Oh, there we see. go. It's hiding. How silly. <laughs> Yay. Okay, good, good. Question solved. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> that was like a, a break fix instance in- No, I've so never had that happen, but it just sort of blanked everything out. All right. Cool, how is everybody? Pretty good, Great. not bad. I'm recovering from rotator cuff surgery and I'm tired of being a, a one-armed left-handed person. Man, Ooh. when do you get back to pitching? They say six months. Six months, and then you'll be on the mound again. <laughs> nice. Uh, Richard, what's your 20? What's your, what's your location today? Um, actually, Menlo Park. Oh, sweet. Thank you. Uh, I actually spent a couple of days with uh, Dave Whitzel, so. Love that. Uh, Going to see him in a month or so. Uh, we're passing through Oakland on our way down to Palo Alto for stuff, uh, into San Francisco for stuff. Um, very cool. Love that. Um, this is a check-in call, so we'd sort of uh, consult one another to see what sort of Rexy things we're, we're busy diving into. Um, I'm happy to, I'm, I'm sort of starting to focus on design from trust and was didn't, didn't get to send an email out yesterday to invite people to start sort of uh, exploring that idea together. I'm happy to dive into that, but I'd, I'd rather hear what other people are, are up to that bears on topics of trust and relationships and other sorts of things. And the way these check-in calls generally work is we just trip across something that sounds interesting and then we pursue it for a while. And, and sometimes that's a fruitful uh, quest. So, uh, Whoever would like to sort of talk about what's on their on their plate or mind, I got, Kelly. Anything in particular that's uh, that's striking you? We um, I have not been on a Rex call in a long time because they have fallen exactly when we have hosted uh, meetings with our company. And so one of the meetings we had recently was uh, uh, what did we call it? It was leveraging AI for customer success. And so we had a bunch of people who are in the support and service space come and sort of talk about how we might do that. And the, the um, question that always comes up is, you know, AI, is AI going to replace all of our jobs, right? Everyone's mm -hmm. like, oh, this is it. It's just, we're going to be run by the machines. But in this recent meeting, we um, were talking about, there's a movie called, a documentary called Alpha Go. Mm -hmm. about the people who has everybody seen it I had not seen it and so I've not seen I, it it's on my playlist it's on my things of things to see on Netflix but it is on Netflix 
so worth it. It's so good. It sounds like such a nerd movie, right? You're like, oh, well, a movie about people building an AI to play a game. Like that sounds ridiculous, but totally um, suspenseful. You're totally, it's amazing who you root for or when. Uh, and it was recommended by a good friend of ours um, around kind of this whole AI piece. And the so I watched it on the plane on the way home and came home and immediately made my kids watch it because um, I was like, you need to look at neural networks and all these things when you're thinking about your careers, right? Um, but the thing that came out of it for me was really, uh, they, so they built this, you know, they built AlphaGo and it plays against a, the, one of the best players in the world and it wins several of the games, um, spoiler alert. Uh, but um, what they learn from it is the, is the way AlphaGo plays is, is different than a, the way a human plays, right? So the way it, it might make a, a move that, you know, one in 10,000 humans might make based on all of the things that it, is, it has learned over the way it's been programmed. And, and it doesn't care how much it wins by, right? Like the, it's, it's sort of like, I, whatever, if I win by three, that's the same to me as winning by a hundred thousand. And so I've been thinking a lot about sort of the, you know, what does this mean in terms of outcomes? Do I have to beat you to death or can I just beat you a little bit or, you know, sort of how, how we can work with our machine overlords to, um, to, to change the way we think about some of these things. So that was looking at, you know, sort of the patterns and, and our approaches. I think there's a whole new world opening up. And the, the kind of interesting uh, follow on to that in, in AlphaGo, the, the kind of next generation that is beating AlphaGo is actually a hybrid of uh, AI and human. They're finding that kind of putting the two together is actually better than just one. Which was the, yeah, which is exactly what they found when the, with the chests when they did the whole yeah. um, Watson thing too, right? That's yeah. interesting. I hadn't heard that. That's awesome. In the documentary, do they do AlphaGo Zero or did they publish the documentary before they did that experiment? I think they. I think the documentary was out first. And, and, and do you know the story of AlphaGo Zero? No. Okay, so it's it's double of like fascinating because the AlphaGo story is really cool all by itself and. To train AlphaGo, which they do what you normally do for neural networks, which is you show it all the best games that have ever been played. And because Go is an ancient game and they've recorded who did what move, just like chess, but much older, uh, because they have all these games, they can feed it a bunch of stuff. That's how they trained it up to play Lee Seedal. Um, and so the, the documentary is about the, the battle between you know, AlphaGo and the neural networks team at, at uh, DeepMind, which is Google, and Lee Seedal and the rest of the Go community in the world. And from that, they learned that, that the game starts to invent moves. And, and at one point, there's a, there's a scene uh, in one of the games where the person who's putting down the stones for AlphaGo is about to put the stone down where he thinks the stone's supposed to go, and the move is completely different. And like okay. everybody sort of does a double take, and the stone goes over here, not over here. And that's like a, a, a creative leap by AlphaGo, right? So AlphaGo Zero doesn't do what you normally do. They don't train it up on games. What they do is they just give it the rules of Go. And they let it play itself. They basically have copies of AlphaGo Zero running against each other, and it starts not knowing anything except the basic rules of Go, and it starts making all the mistakes. And then they watch it learn. And basically, basically it gets as good as AlphaGo after 48 hours or less. Wow. Like, with, with no examples of great games from before. Then it cruises on past that. And where it levels out is way above everybody's capacity. And Go scholars are now studying the moves that AlphaGo Zero invented because they're so different from the tradition of Go. And, and, and anything that has this longer tradition has like expectations around what you do in this sort of situation. When are you in danger? When are you not? And what you just said about it doesn't care whether you win by a little or a lot is super interesting, right? Because yeah. if, if the only, if the, the function you're aiming for is merely victory and you win always by one, but you always win, that's pretty valid and it has very different implications for the competitive environment, all that kind of stuff. So that's super interesting. And what I didn't know was that there, and this is, I guess, an obvious next step, in chess, once Deep Blue beat Kasparov, you got this thing called freestyle chess, which is teams with machines competing against each other. And that's turned out to be a really interesting, fun, creative thing. I didn't realize that was happening now in Go, which makes total sense as well. So, so the, the symbiotic relationship or the complementary relationship between humans and, and different kinds of machine learning 
is like crazy interesting and insanely dangerous to our traditional notions of what work is, who's going to have a job 30 years from now, all of that. Wow. Susan, are you up on the on yeah, the chat. On the chat. Yeah, okay. Very Susan, good. Susan, are you hitting alpha goish kind of kind of stuff in your work? Um no, but I should be. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I uh, I've been pushing forward on um this idea of a conversational metaphor for machine human uh interaction um in, in the large. And partly I'm doing this for some of the social reasons, which is we need to have a way to better interact with all of these bots, with all of this, um, you know, digital, digital workforce, if you want to call it that. Um, and so I've been pushing harder on, uh, into, into the, um, the various, the three literatures, which I've mentioned before and, um, and trying to pull out, well, I mean, making long lists of <laughs> here are the concepts that are in this category and this category and this category. Everything from turn taking and um, so on and so forth to these amazing, uh, and, well, what strikes me is that there are universals in this space, that is to say, that cross language. And those are the ones that strikes me that would be useful to try to uh, incorporate as a a uh, you know for the for the interaction um, an architecture for the interaction mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I'm 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 deep into this I'm working with of all things um, an intern at Media X um, who is a script writer so um, I will let let you imagine how that fits in but it does. That is super interesting. There's also like the world of semiotics kind of cuts in here and symbols Absolutely. because everybody except my mom seems to know that, that two, two, horizontal, two vertical lines means pause, mm -hmm. right? And we, we kind of know that, yeah. right? It's like you see, you see a square, you see a triangle, you see two lines, you, you know that this is a play of video interface, right? And, and everybody's gotten used to it except of course mom. Um, uh, but that factors in here as well because it becomes one of these it, it's sort of it's a man-made universal that now fits into that little language interplay and is visual not auditory not textual right right i think i think one of the things that uh i'll just put throw out one idea that uh has really struck me is that in in conversation in terms of the uh, uh, it, it's been discovered that um Every 84 seconds, we say, um, or oh, we tend to discount these things. And it turns out they're, very, they're, they're part of moving the conversation forward and signaling various things, just like other things. So those kinds of uh, repair mechanisms are something that I think is a concept we might want to figure out. Somebody, please, <laughs> figure out how it is that you, I mean, when was the last time you felt like saying to a chatbot, what? <laughs> you know, uh, and, and they've been discarded in the formal linguistics literature. And now that the, and I've mentioned this before, the Chomsky hegemony is um, falling apart. Um, all these people are coming out of the woodworks with, woodwork with pretty sophisticated understandings of the structure of, of, of real conversation in everyday life. Oh, super interesting. Yeah. I, I recently, um, was listening to Spanish speaking people giving talks, presentations through Zoom in English. Right. And their English is very good, but there's a Spanish habit where it's like, eh, yeah. like, eh, fills every gap. And there's these yeah. very long, eh, it's as if yeah. they're holding the space with the eh, so you won't. They are, eh. they are. They're holding the space, and, you know, a charitable interpretation is that, um, they want you to know that they're in control, that they're, they, they're not, it's not cognitive uh, uh, turbulence. And is it because in Spanish culture, the other person is more likely to jump in and take over the conversation and interrupt if you're not making a sound that fills the space? You know, that would go further than I think the research has gone, but yeah. that's the kind of thing one would want to know. I think what we do know is this, um, the uh-huh and uh, are pre pretty, pretty universal. 
I mean, every language has them has some device for for doing that. There's also yeah, in, some in Spanish. Like it's sorry, Richard. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. The Spanish term "osea" is a, a filler. There's like uh, there's like three or four actually in addition to the the long "a". Uh, yeah, there's there's actually you know kind of uh, little phrases that are just meant to kind of again hold the hold the space without uh, giving it up. And the other thing in Spanish too um, is a long a long vowel. I think there's actually is in even in English in other languages when the long vowel is a as a way to kind of stretch out a thought um, is is kind of a, an indicator of lower education. So so you you want to sound more sophisticated by stretching out a long vowel. Um, it's uh, it's kind of something that's considered you know somebody from the countryside a, a, a typical. If you want to carry them, that's one of the things that you add. Yeah. That's fascinating. So it's, it is, there's that, there's another whole line of, uh, that opens up is, um, uh, we are ready to respond. Those of you who are familiar with System Watt Kahneman's work in the thinking fast and slow, we are, um, that we are ready to respond within 200 milliseconds which is about the time it takes to blink your eye. And so um, some of these things help us gauge whether a response is fast, on time, late, or unlikely to arrive at all. And I think those, the, that, the longer that is, this opens up the whole, an inference chain on the part of, of the speaker. Now, I want to be understood as not saying we should make sure that all of our chatbots respond in 200 milliseconds, <laughs> but rather that um, if we don't, if that, that that expectation is universal to the extent that these things become conversational. What's um, interesting also is that as you're speaking, each of us is composing whether or not to interrupt and what we think about it. And we're like, the, the reason for the really short delay between when we're ready to respond is that we're pre-composing as if, if we're not paying full attention and actually present and absorbing what you're saying we're busy composing our reply as you talk and a bot yeah. might have to re re like wait until you hit enter right unless it's watching like google watches searches in your browser and is busy with ajax basically like absorbing and trying to respond as you begin to type which is i think quite yeah. quite a clever use of of technology right right so, so the anybody... question is, if you had an, a conversational, and you heard it here first, conversational infrastructure <laughs> to, to the architecture, then, um, then I, I don't know, I, I, it, you can see it emerging. Actually, if you look at Microsoft's, uh, if you look at Microsoft's, um, what's it called? Their bot, their bot constructor, whatever that framework, the framework right? Mm -hmm. You can see that they've got, they've got all kinds of things hooked together, right? Um, and if those are conversing, all of those things are conversing with each other. It's not just me and you, and it's not just me and, and something else. If those things are conversing with each other, um, it would be interesting to see what the hookup looks like and whether, and what the timing is on Timing is one thing whether you can repair something like if the two of them are in conflict, you know, we interrupt each other and or we say it later or whatever, but we, we notice and say is that, you know, is that true? Um, blah, 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 blah. Well, uh, one of the things um, <clears throat> we heard a uh, presentation from a, a woman at IBM research that was doing visual interpretation of facial expression and uh and um, is anybody aware of a bot that uses both um auditory and visual cues to improve that interaction i mean we do but <laughs> yeah but we're not bots are we um, <laughs> not yet not yet but it seems you know one of the things you learn in speech school is that 80% of the, what you communicate is through body language and facial expression and not the words, not the text. Um, well, this has been known for a long time, but it's not, the part of the thing is that the people who know about what you're talking about and the people who know about 
the structure of conversation. Don't, I mean, they're so far apart in, <laughs> in their skills yeah. and their knowledge and their, you know, I mean, it's, it's going to take a while, but I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. It's an obvious thing to try. Yeah. There's a project I, I saw demoed that showed up at I, the Institute for the Future some time ago. Jamee wouldn't remember who it is. I'm trying to find her in my brain. Um, it's we, us, we, me, something like that. And it basically watches a two person video call and it coaches each participant by looking at video, at, uh, at facial cues, by looking at turn taking, who, who ate the most time, by looking at the pitch and intonation, uh, sort of the structure, the, the auditory signature of sentences, and a bunch of other stuff. And it might come back to you and say, hey, you know, like, I'm, I'm, it won't speak to you this way, but hey, you're hogging the conversation, you should speak less. Uh, it seems like you're not being very assertive. It, it, it can begin to infer things like that. I don't know how good it is at this, but it's trying to do that. And but you, but think of the, the, the question is when somebody does that, are they basing it on on their assumptions about how things should go? Like right. we think we should take out speech. You know, we'll tell you to take out the ums and the os. Well, you know, they're there for a reason. Exactly. I was also going to add a tiny, another tiny uh, speech thing I've noticed is that in some places uh, it's expected that when you're in a two person conversation, the other person is acknowledging periodically. They're punctuating with, uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. I get it. Uh -huh. It's called uh, um, uh, back, uh, back, back chatter. Back chatter. The back, huh? channel, back channeling. Yeah. Back channel. I've heard of it as active listening. Yeah. yeah. But in other cultures, if you interrupt at all, that ain't good. You should just be mute until the person is done talking. And then it's turned to- The time, to it's traffic. how long, right? It's how long you wait. Because, and the, the signals are very, well, I've said this before, and probably right. in this group when, yeah. Well, you know what the secret to good, to good humor is, right? Timing. Timing, yep. That pause. The timing is completely culturally. Mm -hmm. dependent and even reversed or right the it's, it's not a matter of the shift of duration but complete uh, rhythms etc this this gets quite I mean Susan you said what are we what are we coaching towards and what are we mm -hmm. assuming for me there's the, the next step is and what if we're actually looking at something like pair programming that is, we're looking at people who are actually elbow to elbow working together, yep. even if they're sitting opposite each other in a Zoom environment. Mm -hmm. um, and what if that's happening at a greater scale than two? And what if that's, oh, yeah. et cetera? And does any of this in, the, in these that, that we've been summoning even do anything except obscure <laughs> in that context? Right. Well, I think, I think there are things we can, we can do. I mean, one of the things is that all the things that we are bringing up, because I have a feel for this literature, um, it is known. I mean, people study this. It's already, it's already there are pieces of it out there that are understood. And one of the things that I'm trying to call attention to is thought. Because if you look at the, if you look at the conversational maxims that are being used, it's as if nobody ever learned anything. You know? I mean, yeah. Precisely. You think it's because there's a, a new context to look at this within? Like all of a sudden this is interesting because we can put it into the context of... Yes, but it should, be our, it, should be, it should be our reaction. I'm getting old now, aren't I? It should be our reaction to say somebody must have thought of this. Hold on. I'm going to go to the card catalog right now and find out. <laughs> Let me phone the librarian. That's right. Yeah. Let me call our research assistant. Yes, all those things that we don't have anymore. How it used to happen, right? Now, if we had a really smart bot, so let's pretend that we had a listener bot that was watching our chat and listening to our audio that was then making really clever suggestions about existing research. I mean, it, it knew how to go data mine for research. And then maybe a human was filtering what the bot is suggesting and putting the most relevant things into the conversation so that, so that we don't get the whole, the whole flotilla of trash but we actually get some really good results. And then we could go back and, and, ex and explore what was found during the conversation that yeah. seemed germane as we went. That would be pretty useful. I'd like that. And I mean, that kind of the whole idea of not just uh, cultural, but actually personal style. So there's some people who, uh, you know, 
I think I interrupt more than I should, but it's just my way. I, I have a, you know, something bubbling in my head and I want to get it out before I forget it. Uh, there's other people who, who just need like a, a piece of silence to kind of process something and they want to think deeply and then they come back. Well, they have the bot kind of learn and know that it should be interrupting me all the time, but there's somebody else that it, it should not, uh, if there's a long pause, they shouldn't be saying, are you still there? They should just know so that the bot actually kind of learns the style and, and can be more effective with each individual understanding what their, you know, their communication style is, not just culturally, but even within a culture. And then just to add a layer on that, <clears throat> the context of the conversation matters a lot. So oh. for example, in a negotiation, silence is extremely powerful. And it's yeah. very different from silence when you're just waiting for somebody to understand something in an explanation, right? But in negotiation, yeah. si silence will sometimes cause the other party to continue putting things on the table that they didn't yeah. mean to give away because they're like, oh, they're, they're, they're about to walk away from negotiation. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, and look, look at what's happening now. Um, you know, I, I said something, my voice, you know, and it interrupted the flow of what Jerry was trying to say. Whereas in conversation, it wouldn't, but I think it interrupted it because my face flashed on the screen. And also, uh, I mean, you talk about the 200 millisecond delay. My, my first summer job was at Satellite Business Systems in McLean, Virginia, and like in their system test facility where I learned how we chop up audio, send it up to a satellite, bounce it back down to an earth station, get that into somebody's ear, and reassemble it quickly enough that we're not noticeably disturbed by the delay. And I was like, what? It's happening, it what? And, and so a piece of what's happening to us here is that we're being mediated by Zoom, which is pretty good at that, but not mm -hmm. perfect at that. Yeah. So I find, I find in a room with live humans, one of my skills is interrupting and waiting for the pause and in the breath, making a little funny comment or whatever. It's one of the things I do pretty well. Mm -hmm. I find that that sort of superpower weakened considerably in a video call. I find that, that that's hard. So I wind up sort of doing something in the chat, which is why I like Zoom chat living over here. So I, I'll, I'll make side comments there or whatever. But, or, or I teach everybody hand signals. Mm -hmm. And then it's really fun in the Zoom Brady Bunch or a part, whatever view to see a, a bunch of people you know, doing this or that over time as, as that behavior is contagious. And, and that's just sort of multimodal, many, many channels, many bands working together, which I like a lot. I, I think Zoom I recently uh, was part of a journey of a number of people who were using Zoom uh, steadily together over a few weeks for the first time. And this combination, and I've been a Zoom observer and fan since I think the first year they were on the market, right? This thing of the chat on the right, what they call split view or something, and then the uh, Brady Bunch view, and being able to, with your right hand, click directly on a person or chat with the whole room and use hand signals. Hand signals are important to get a sense of. I think it gets pretty close to feeling like a social system. Yeah rather than uh, a technology. And I think one of the reasons why all this research is not relevant, mixing Susan and Kelly's great words, is because it's so dominated by information theory. Hmm. And really all of this is about interaction between humans, which of course is what work is is and is more and more becoming if humans are involved in work at all right um which requires that um uh, which is in the realm of social system and then furthermore as i've been so i've been swimming around in various domains as researching this idea of grammar of productivity so grammar as it turns out is viewed by the sociolinguists is something that changes all the time and between speak not just speakers of a language or at the kind of public sphere level but in the course of a relationship it's that thing that is being negotiated and shifting as the character and content and context mm -hmm. and media of the interaction shift so um so just putting that next dimension of variability in. Um, and then I was gonna throw one more thought in. 
uh, which was, do, we oh, want, do we want to design that variability in or do we, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of saying, look, we've got these universals. That's interesting. Right? I get really, um, I mean, we could say, I'm, I'm happy for someone to show me universals that really work universally, but I, I don't think that that's been the case in a lot of this communication literature it's simply oh, no. at this it's, start, it's just starting to come because people yeah 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 so but, so in, in lack of that but but i think perhaps we do because there's the other concept i want to throw in here is from uh the communications domains which are mm -hmm. one of the places where a lot of the stuff is buried in different ways and in chronemics in particular which is the idea of a temporal commons and I think Rex is a good idea, right? We manage when, when, by virtue of being in some social formation together, in some project, in some conversation, right? One of the things we have is a commons in time, how we use time, et cetera. I don't think anybody's written, there's a bunch of stuff written about the hegemony of uh, industrial culture over rules for the temporal uh, commons, but not really gone before that. Um, and so there's room here to bring everything that we kind of know about commons, which shifts as, in a sense, the work being done in the commons shifts. And so to me, that that is, if not above, it's at the same level as universals. It's the specifics yeah. of, you know, what we're growing on the commons, how we're living here, what's going, yeah, et cetera. So and uh, we've agreed I, to, I think I should shut up. You, I mean. Susan, no. your connection's breaking up a little bit on us. Can you repeat the last thing you said, Susan? I was just, I was just gonna say that I think, I think the, the commons and what very, one of the things you've said is a stage in which the international style has been co-constructed and we have learned sort of, except for this, um, <laughs> uh, how, how to behave. This is the universal sign for the chicken dance. <laughs> <laughs> and this is talk talk. Yeah. <laughs> and what's this? <laughs> we should invent a whole new system of hand signs for video conferencing and propagate them and make them really silly. Oh no, there's the silly version. <laughs> you know, I, I'm squaring you. Yeah. <laughs> and as always, I'm gonna crush you. If anybody could do this, Jerry could do this. Yes, Jerry. At least we found a thing that's worthwhile for humanity to work on together, I like that. Mikulski speak. Yeah. Yeah, I could go wild with that, yes. Um, I don't know, but it's even, I mean, gesture is a piece of it, but it's also, it's, it's actually what to do with your face on, on, on Zoom, right? On video, yeah. It's a little bit like yeah. people who and don't I know think, what to do with their hands when they're standing in a crowd. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here's yeah. like, cameras yeah. are here. And, and, and sometimes that look that you get when you're looking at your screen is that, is, is, while you're in Zoom is exactly what is expected and desired by the other person because you're engaging in the, whatever that is. Some people solve not. the problem by doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that. Yeah. I, just, he's like, I just turned my camera way up. Yeah. Oh. That's yeah. Cool. I, I was like. going to say, and you just discovered that. This is not, we, yeah. yeah. It's a new thought, huh? Uh-huh. 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 See? But those things, those, those kind, yes, never mind. I'm not going to go back on that or something. Greg, yeah. what was the article? Was it Patrick Linconi? And it was the whole, like, what's my face? What was that whole oh, thing about? Yeah, um, right. It's the face that we make. Um, there's a face we make that isn't really helpful or um, that's negative. It's off-putting or something. Yeah. Let me, I'm going to, I'll find it. it uh, that was a pretty good one. Uh, well, you know, there's this idea of, um, I put in the chat there, a thought around universal criteria for adaptability. So one of the things we've been talking a lot about is um, 
what somebody mentioned earlier is that uh, you know using this technology to complement human capability um, and some of the imp interesting implications of that and the, how dynamic it has to be um, in terms of being adaptable to different preferences and different styles and uh, and being really helpful to the point to that teetering edge of creepiness because um, once you flip over that edge um, it, you know it takes a long time to recover uh, the level of trust um, that's needed in order to really become adaptive at an individual level. So we talk about we talk a lot about this what we call the nomi factor, which is what enables um, us to be uh, adaptive or you know relating in a way that others find acceptable or helpful. Um, and that varies by individual, pretty pretty dramatically. Um, and so, how do we how do we leverage this technology to reflect that level of adaptivity that pushes the boundaries but doesn't cross the boundary of creepiness? And there's the in the world of avatars and light and verisimilitude and lifelike representations. There's something known as the uncanny valley, which is the place at which the thing has gotten to look real enough that it might be mistaken for human but not real enough so that it's like in this really creepy mode and you kind of don't want to associate with it it's a little bit like black mirror episodes for me like it, it, they feel too much like something that could happen next week so i had to stop watching black mirror it's like nope nope i see this coming it's too close to reality can't go there yeah i love the uncanny valley of help i think that's hilarious i mean and very true because you know why did you know that about me how did you know if you're if you're not being really explicit about kind of the information that you have and and the fact that you have are now assuming this as a preference if then someone engages with me in a way that i was not expecting that is absolutely the uncanny valley of help and and so i talk a lot um about stock or serve and I, I, you know, talk to companies and I say, hey, mostly you're stalking people. You're busy hoovering up their data. You're shocking them. You're, you're tracking them across websites with, you know, um, horizontal um, uh, tracking and uh, what's it called? Uh, re something retargeting. There's a whole industry for retargeting. All that kind of stuff is pretty creepy. And we're talking about different levels of creepy now, depending on what you can infer from expression and from a lot of more fine-grained things than did I like something on Facebook. Uh, and then being of service is the opposite to me and also requires remembering something about me. So I, you know, in order to be of good service, you actually need to kind of understand me, my patterns, my rhythms, and you need to have permission from me uh, to be in that kind of relationship. It's a high trust to work well, and it needs to be a high trust, well-informed back and forth thing. And I think that, that nobody's making that distinction, that mostly we're in the stalker economy and hey, let's just go for it. And if we hit trouble down the road, that's too bad, everybody else is doing it, so we kind of have to follow, uh, follow anyway. Look, one of those pauses, I like that. I like that, the stalker economy, you could write that. Uh, there's actually a bunch of writing already on the stalker economy and on uh, surveillance capitalism. So if you Google either term, you'll find uh, uh, some people have already gone there. Yeah, I've got yeah, surveillance capitalism. Yeah. I'm I'm anxiously awaiting uh, Shoshana Zuboff's new book. Hmm. What um, title? You know? Well, I think she changed the title. I thought it was. Um, Master or slave? Mm, nice. And, um, we looked it up recently. Kelly, do you remember what? No, I'm looking there they, now. They said it was. <laughs> she just does some amazing uh, work. The age of surveillance capitalism: the fight for a human future and the new frontier of power. Yeah. Wow. So what are we going to do to get the attention of the people instead of ourselves, although this is lovely, <laughs> of people who, who could do something about bringing these kinds of ideas forward? Or maybe we just think we're doing it. I, th I mean, it's, it's kind of combating the soccer economy, I think the, the biggest force out there now is the European Commission 
Um, you know, they, they do well um, battling monopolies when they're on, formed on this side of the, of uh, the Atlantic. Um, but uh, so, so, I mean, they're gonna continue coming up with regulations that are, it'll be increasingly difficult for um, big Silicon Valley tech companies to uh, kind of go a dual path and they'll have to kind of conform to the standards of the European Union across across the world. So, I mean, I, I'm not a big believer in the uh, power of the European Commission, but and this is one area, at least in data privacy, where they're pretty strong uh, and they wield a big stick because they cover such a large part of the economy. <laughs> And I think because these co these values are really deeply ingrained in leading cultures in in Europe, you know Germany's divided history being, uh, and before right, uh, a really strong foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, partly also, um, consumerism ate our brains first. And, and if you're a consumer, you don't give a crap about who has your info and whatever, they're just gonna target you with stuff you wanna buy better and more of and whatever, or you've given up on the fight or something like that. So, um, and then all of our legislators are predisposed to do business friendly things anyway. Uh, so, yeah. so the whole fight for data privacy and, and rights of the individual loses here much more easily than it does in Europe. I don't have a good idea other than watching China do social credit, but across the rest of Asia, I don't have a good idea of how these things fall there. I'm curious because that's a lot of humans and, and I don't know about privacy, you know, legislation there and, and approaches and, and crises and what's happening. So apparently none of us does. Me either. <laughs> I mean, you know what? That's my like min minimal. It was. I remember. This is ancient history now, but I remember. Um, I was surprised at how quickly Indonesia picked up um, the use of social software. I mean, they were, in some ways, kind of quicker adopters and disseminators of Facebook even than in the U.S. Um, and then and again, this kind of was a small example, but um, in uh, Myanmar. They, they don't talk about being on the internet. You ask people, you know, do you have access to the internet? And they'll say no. And then they'll say, but I do have Facebook um, because Facebook, you know, subsidizes access uh, for people's accounts. They don't have to pay for the internet access as long as they only remain on Facebook. So. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that, that puts a whole new spin on all the fake news and all the, <laughs> bots and all the oh my god well yeah. um, one of the things we we're trying to do with so kelly and i both work for a nonprofit industry association that uh, deals with a lot of high-tech companies um all of them global but most of them the majority of them based in the u.s ericsson's out of stockholm and a few international ones but th that are more international than others maybe but one of the things we keep um harping on to try and drive um I guess how companies approach leveraging these emerging capabilities um, is the brand promise, which I think um, you know companies have a, have mission statements and they have values and but most of our members, the people that we work with, don't really have an explicit brand promise. So a brand promise we've defined as <clears throat> what you want your customers to say about you when you're not in the room. That's what your customers say to each other. And so it's things like they're fun to deal with, they're available, they're approachable, they're intelligent, they're... They have my best interests and not they my mind. Mind. They're trust, trustworthy. Mm. Um, and when you have an explicit brand promise, then um, that really becomes a foundation for how you design those, those points of engagement because you want every interaction to reinforce that brand promise. And if that really becomes part of the DNA of the company, then the likelihood that they're going to do things that are really in the interest of the people they serve um, is greatly increased, I think. And so that's you know, the question of what are we going to do about this? I think we've been talking a lot with the members about are you designing your, you know, your machine learning and your cognitive computing and your um, all, all these emerging uh, automation capabilities to really reinforce your brand promise. 
And I think that's a nice, um, an important actually check on, are you doing these things just to improve your own efficiency or is it actually serving the interests of your customers and actually reinforcing your brand promise? So in my mind, that kind of forms, if we can get people to really buy into or feel the brand promise is important and have one that's explicit, it will influence decision making on how you design those points of interaction. So that's my hope for what we're doing, <laughs> what we can do. That's lovely. <clears throat> and, and I think um, in some sense, getting, uh, being clearer about intentions um, as companies is a big deal. And I think, I think a lot of the things we're sort of talking about now have something to do with intentions or intent. Uh, if Kevin Clark were on the call, he'd be all over that as well. Um, and, oh, and that's, and that's uh, you know, Shoshona's, um, I might not get this exactly right, but she talks about the purpose of business is to enable us as individuals to live our lives the way we choose. Mm, wouldn't that be nice? And that, <laughs> that's a pretty strong intent. <laughs> that's actually quite different from <laughs> the reality of most businesses today. Can you read that again? So let's a question before we move too far on. So you just, you were talking about the points of interaction and designing the, those things. And do you think that, um, can you design, do you ever think about what it is? I mean, to me, it's the interaction that's interesting, um, not just the, the endpoints. Can you say something about what it would be to, or not, maybe it's not possible, design interaction? Well, we're seeing, um, I think, a lot of progress using journey mapping, um, where, so, you actually, in in considerable amount of detail, um, map out the points of interaction along the customer journey from awareness to purchase to install to use to renewal. <clears throat> um, and those journey maps actually help you visualize from the customer's point of view um, those points of interaction and which ones are most critical and which ones, you know, where's your... Where's your biggest point of departure in, on that customer journey um, and why? And understanding those really helps um, companies improve their process, their policies, um, the way they interact uh, to try and improve the customer experience and productivity. How does that fit for you, Susan? So I think the only thing I didn't hear you say, although I was typing in the chat while you're talking, was um, sort of touching on the co-creation of value and the mm. fact that so many things that we are selling require people to interact with it in order to generate any value. Right? Yeah. You have to, the, the consumer has to unlock the value of whatever it is we're um, peddling and therefore we the really the only way we can do that is is to design with with the consumer right in any sustainable way yeah. right but let's just so there's but there's a gap isn't there between designing with the consumer which participatory design for lack of a better term yeah. and the co-creation of value at the point of use absolutely but i think you you make that gap smaller <laughs> <laughs> if you start with the with the person who'd like to realize the value first. Yeah, yeah but I, there is this sort of, um, I wish we had better uh, co-creation of value detectors. Mm. Well, we, we've been talking you know, about a customer presence indicator for a company that says, you know, to what degree are your customers involved in designing process, policy, um, product, feature, functionality? Um, and I... I to me, this this is a great frontier. It's uh, removing the design process from a, a private lab that has no customer presence to an environment where customer presence is very, very high. Um, so some kind of press, customer presence indicator would be a great uh, measure of companies' success in, in really embracing the co-creation concept. Uh, and that's a great point, Kelly, that comp complements the journey mapping, right? So one, one area that's kind of interesting to, to look at is uh, in the book Peers, Inc., 
uh, kind of look at the creation of platforms. So platforms is a place where um, you have this kind of early dance where you've got to build up enough people on the platform to have the critical mass to be able to actually uh, have matching between the, you know, the service and the customer. Um, and, you know, there's this kind of early time when you bend over backwards to meet the needs of your, your users. And as you, as the platform becomes more successful, then, uh, it'd be, you know, the, whoever's managing the platform has kind of, you know, a little more, they, 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 get, they become more dictatorial over the changes. You know, you so you can look at Airbnb or Uber or a lot of the, the platform, but, it, but since they are, they have to be created publicly. I mean, they're dependent on, um, you know, the customer is there from day one. Uh, but you see this kind of dance between, uh, you know, who has the power and, and, and if you, if you really fully don't have the, uh, kind of co-creation of value, the, the platform is going to go away. Uh, but, uh, but that yeah. in, in that book, it's, it's, uh, she does a great job of, of, uh, Robin, um, does a great job of kind of laying that out and she's very thoughtful about it and actually, um, you know, talks about kind of warts and all about how, how that goes. Well, I think the, uh, the agile, uh, the embracing of the agile concepts in development organizations and writing stories that are written from the point of view of the customer, but, but not often written by customers. Um, so it seems to me it's a step in that direction of engaging customers in the development process, or at least trying to reflect their interests through stories. Um, and maybe there are some that actually have customers write the stories. Uh, you know, some, we're always encouraging our members to do journey mapping with customers in the room, mm -hmm. not a journey map in the absence of customers and then sharing it with them afterwards. Cause mm -hmm. um, the customer will come up with all kinds of interesting things that the company won't. Um, what so is the I, company, how are they responding to to all of that information about what the customers are, because a lot of people will throw their hands in despair. Yeah. Well, it's challenging. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I was going to say. With that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the it really requires, I think, an enlightened executive team that is willing to be vulnerable, um, and and which in turn helps build trust. Right. Vulnerability and and trust are kind of hand in hand, I think. And and uh, a lot of companies still aren't. I, I would say, you know, we there are some we have some groups we work with have enlightened executives who understand that and um, are willing to take the risk of engaging customers in a very rich way. And others are still very hesitant to do that. So I think it's emerging. I feel like we're moving in the direction of, of a stronger level of engagement. I, I have um, a, a few things to lab in here. So one is, as we were just speaking now about customer journey and customers in the room, I was transported to probably the best customer co-design experience I've ever witnessed, which was there was a brief moment in time where a very cool pharmaceutical company, and there was such a thing, convened this incredible gathering. Shortly thereafter, the CEO got replaced and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, um, and they were... Their premise had long been beyond the pill, right? They created that, that that's where they were focused. And so this group had strategy people and marketing people and sort of Madison Avenue people and Silicon Valley people, half the room, the other half was the brand team. As it, the days unfolded, it turned out that various people in the room had various relationships to the disease or condition that this pill was about. And some of them included being parents of people with this, right? So the, I never figured out how intentional um, all of this was, but it felt like if you got to a certain level of, of uh, multiple, multivariate balancing in this group, the rest took care of itself. In any way, I remember that the issue of the customer journey, it's like all of a sudden, so some of us were there discovering that we were also kind of customers and it's like, well, let's see what to, as a customer, what do I want? What is my journey? Right. And then realizing it's, a, it's not really as a customer, it's first as a purchaser and then it's as a, right. So there's a whole, which 
is all very far from Jerry's point about being people and Shoshana's point about, you know, letting me do what I want to do in my life. Because most of those conversations at some point, even when the customer is most creatively and most deeply in the room, right, that customer is figuring out what roles they play with respect to this conversation. And Jerry, your, your deepest, deepest point, we are, we are not fundamentally consumers, right? And we're not fundamentally customers either. Exactly, exactly, right. And there is, a, so for me, there is like a genuine place where we, we are purchasers, right? Uh, I like to think I'm less and less of a purchaser, right? But that whole thing, there's a genuine point of, of purchasing. And so what about this, you know, 98% of life that's about living as a person, right? Doing business of life, as I've been calling it. And so I think recently looking back over the mind and minding work over the last, it's getting to be almost a decade, but the product thinking that Jerry was involved in some um, about five years ago about sh which among other things had a moment of shifting shifting the conversation i remember uh, doc's intention economy arrived in an amazon box at my doorstep in that way that happens where you have no recollection of buying the book <laughs> it's just there right in the middle of this of this design um exercise and the key moment was, and we talked to somebody mentioned it earlier about giving, you get out of the valley of creepiness or the hall of creepiness by having given permission. So what if this whole thing, now that we're, now that we're wise to just how kidnapped our, our minds are, you know, what if the whole thing shifts to, hey, I'll invite you into my mind. I'll give you a little piece of my attention, provided you show me that you got something interesting to do with me, right, in this, in this actual technical space, right? And oh, by the way, it's, it's a collaborative space. It's actually the same kind of a space in which I sit with my Rex crowd or my co-designer or co-founders or et cetera. Anyway, I'm, I had this kind of moment the other day. These are all, I'm sure everybody on this call values these where you go, oh my God, something I've been thinking for five years. Actually. <laughs> Somebody else is thinking of it. No, it yeah. might be now. It might be, right. It, 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 it would, yeah, anyway, so. Um, just two, two things triggered by what you were saying, Essie. One, one is at, at one point in my checkered human journey, <clears throat> I was a facilitator for a workshop around a topical pain relieving gel. And as an icebreaker up front, I had everybody imagine like, what is your sport? What is your hobby? What is your thing? And then imagine an injury in that thing. And then I passed around some blue painter's tape, just a little, I gave everybody a two inch strip of tape and I had them put it on where the injury happened and then enact it. So I walked around the room, said, what is your injury? Where is it? Ooh, that must really hurt. And then like, like, ah, whatever. And, and merely as a totally superficial ploy to get people to start empathizing with somebody who's in pain. And, but, and occasionally during the meeting, I'd refer back to that pain. I'd be like, you know, how's your elbow or, or whatever, just trying to sort of- It's my shoulder. Bring back the memory of it. So, so that, that just sort of a, was a, a simple yeah. facilitation ploy to try to bring up what happened naturally in the meeting you were describing because everybody was connected to the, to the situation, right? Um, and then secondly, the thing you just described about, you know, permission to come into my mind, I have a whole riff I call becoming a trusted ally. Um, and it's an aspirational thing. And I think it's the high point in a marketplace. And the example I give to explain becoming a trusted ally is almost a rhetorical example. I ask people, so do you tell your doctor, your nurses, your health insurance company, your whole healthcare nexus, do you tell them everything about your health and well-being and mental state? You don't, because the system is designed to end badly if you actually were to do that, right? Then I ask them a second question, which is, what if you could? What if they were your trusted ally? And what if you could rely on them to be pulling on the rope in the same direction as you are, short of 
you've decided you're going to like kill the principal at school and they need to call in a, like to report you, but short of that, that they were actually busy doing things for you and that they could then bring you behind the curtain for the tools they have and the knowledge they have, then you could help them design the next set of services, right? So, so I think this is actually a, like a, a high, high ground in a marketplace because once you've found your trusted ally for a particular domain, whether it's your finances, your health and well-being and mental well-being or something else, you're not going to leave them. Why would you leave them? Unless they gouge you or, or betray your trust, you're, you're, you're their customer or they're, you're in that relationship for life. Right. Um, and um, that's a brand promise, right? It, it, uh, it, that feels like much more than a brand promise to me, promise? in a sense. What, what? It feels like much more than a brand promise to me because... No, I, that's, that was what I was trying to say before okay. the book cover arrived. That's, that was the thought in my mind is like, whoa, right? That's the ultimate, right? Um, as you put it, high point in the market. And mm -hmm. yes. That would, I mean, if a brand promise were to be taken really earnestly and deeply, it could become that. <clears throat> and, and, and if people sort of took it to heart and if it was an authentic thing in the world, it could make them a trusted ally. Um, but the, the a piece of the trusted ally thing I'm, I'm wrestling with is it's the kind of idea that everybody's going to claim to do and be. So how do you filter that? How do you get to the point where you, some are trustworthy, some are not? How do you label it, market, recognize it? How do people see this when it shows up? It's a little bit like organic, which originally was a term that meant that things are actually grown organically and over time got diluted by the people who had access to regulators so that lots of things that weren't really very organic got to be labeled organic or natural or what, or what have you. So, so how do you preserve in some weird way the purity of the notion of trusted ally uh, so that it becomes a sharper distinction and drives companies to better behavior? That's a big open question for me. Well, I think maybe one of the, I mean, the way you do that as a matter of marketing or market development is that you define and then deliver into practice a set of attributes or criteria that become accepted as that, right? And then if you're in technology, right, you have those levers to pull about creating. So what if, uh, micro-credential blockchain distributed ID architectures, right, are, <laughs> are mm -hmm. criterion one for, right, if you're not built on this trustable, tr right, on this different architecture and, and so forth. So, Jerry, why were you smiling and... Uh, I realize we're hogging the conversation. No, not at all. I was smiling in the middle because I asked Susan what the title of the book that she had shown was, and Kelly was like, bing! Only because Susan sent it to me, so I copied and pasted it. Uh, <laughs> I was like, wow, you read that fast! <laughs> Sorry, Yossi. I had to go out and okay. get it off the shelf. <laughs> you see, misinterpretation of signal, I thought you were like, all right, now, I'm, now I'll go back to feeling more normal. Uh <laughs> Not so appreciated by Jerry that he grinned. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the extensibility of, or the, or the scalability of trust, is, I think probably you have talked about before, Jerry, right? Because I'm thinking like, oh, right, that's the kind of the private relationship that I have built with my doctor over 20 years now. And therefore, if someone new goes to her and says, you know, this is, this is what I do. Like, can you get to that level without investing the time or the, like, how do you, where's the, I mean, I think we have talked about this. Where's the shortcut? Like, I is think, there a, I think there are, can be express lanes where you share much more, more, more quickly. I don't think it takes 20 years to get to the point of intimacy of, and, and relationship to do yeah. that, but, but they're not easy shortcuts. I mean, yeah. It's interesting. Um, Richard and Todd, do, how, does, how do all these topics cut into your worlds? Um, I mean, for me, I've, you know, the, the, you know, the work that I'm doing is a lot within big institutions, the World Bank and IMF. And, uh, 
so there, there's there's less of the it's it's more kind of the internal uh, workings and uh, a lot of them they have their kind of uh, their parallels there as well. So if you're trying to uh, institute something new, there's the the question of um, you know is it worth my time? Is this going to continue? And a lot of that has to do with the relationship between the whoever's bringing instituting it and the, the level of uh, trust that the things that they brought in the past have gotten traction or have been positive. So, like, I mean, just taking the World Bank as an example has so many interesting trust boundaries to deal with. Like, one, I grew up in South America. One of them being like, I'm from the World Bank. I'm here to help. And plenty of countries saying, No, you're not. You know, we know what you did last time. Yeah. Like you just said. Right. But another one also is within the World Bank, historically, they may have fixed this, but the field officers were sort of seen as the cowboys who were out in the field who had like the authority and the privilege and the home office people were sort of second class citizens and there was like friction within the World Bank historically forever. And I don't know if that still exists, but, but the, the, like when you start peeling back who trusts whom and why not, yeah. uh, it gets super interesting and all these historic um, uh, complaints kind of show up pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, and then there's, you know, yeah. Maybe Go ahead. Trust, trust is a proposition. You know, I trust so-and-so for this. Yep, and, and trust is also, um, I find, uh, bounded in domains. So <clears throat> there's, there's a, a, and I said this in my PDF talk, I said, uh, I would trust David Reed with my vote by proxy on any telecom policy issue he cared to, mm -hmm. to rule about but I you know, wouldn't trust him with a three month old. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure he'd pay attention. Like, you know, yeah. keep the three month old alive. He might be a great dad, I have no idea. I just don't know that realm of his life. So, so these, things are, these things are very much bounded by, by the parts of, of things that we understand. And by context. Yeah. And, by, yeah. and over time, you learn things over time. Trust, trust is also very, it's like compound interest. It's, it's, it's very temporal. Um, and you learn about performance over time. Todd, did you want to throw anything in about uh, about your world and these issues? Well, I'm doing a lot of co-thinking with Esty on this minding. Um, Can you speak up or get closer to the mic? Is that better? Yeah. Uh, I'm doing a lot of co-thinking with Esty on on the issue of minding, um, and I. Uh, I'm waiting for a turning point in where technology uh, is in service to us because it still feels like um, mostly everything that's being built and I'm getting, I, I don't know what's going on with the startup world, but I'm getting pitches, um, startup related pitches probably three or four times a week from somebody who wants some attention, from somebody who wants some money, from somebody <clears throat> who wants uh, up to partner. And these aren't even sales um, pitches. These are, are, are just companies looking for uh, a road in. Um, and so when I look at that, and when I look what's happening on AngelList, um, or when I browse Crunchbase, uh, most of the technology is not really created to serve. Um, everyone's looking for a niche that still feels like it's a uh, minor form of extortion. <clears throat> so it's, it's something that both excites me and baffles me as to what is the, how does that change and when does that change um, and how, how can I play a part in that? Agreed. There's a whole, I mean, one of the big background issues here is we need a mind shift of some sort and there's plenty of people writing eloquent, eloquent pieces straight from the heart about how, you know, if only everybody paid more attention or minded the commons or learned about our interdependencies or, 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 or things would be a, a lot better. And I agree with the claim. I just think that the claim mostly falls on deaf ears, that the people who are busy nodding vigorously when they read that prose are already on board and we're not convinced. 
And somehow the people who aren't engaged in that process are not getting it and not being turned by that argument. And one of the questions I have is, what, what, what will engage the, the, the very large number of humans on earth who have either given up hope or are, are actively and intentionally uh, tipping at the systems because it's fun and it works better and they have a lot better time and they find allies on the far side of, of, of you know, of caring uh, or whatever else or, or caring enough to break the system is also a form of caring. That's weird, but I think that's happening a lot right now. Um, caring enough, caring enough to take big risks with the system because the system isn't working for everybody. That's that's I think hot right now, uh, but it's being hijacked by a, a lot of different uh, uh, different groups. But we're 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 at one of those moments historically where where the social contract is up for renegotiation. Nobody's quite sure what works best. Um, uh, there's a drift rightward politically across the across the globe. A uh, whole bunch of other you know, and then there's a there's a drift toward ecological disaster that's being intentionally ignored by a lot of a lot of people and players, which is, which is, strange. I mean, I, I saw Al Gore present once, and the first sentence out of his mouth was, "I'm trying to figure out why I can't seem to convince conservative people and business people that climate change is one of their biggest business opportunities ever, that this is like electrification, that so much needs to be built, made, sold." to fix this problem that they should just leap right in, they're gonna make a bucket of money. Why can't I convince people that that's true? And so I think there's need something the, else. They need the Y2K. Memory. Sorry, Richard, go ahead. The Y2, no, they just, you remember Y2K? I mean, that was, sure. they need to somehow package it like Y2K. But. <laughs> well, but Y2K is an argument against climate change for me. It's like, um, I, you know, is, isn't Y2K a way of dismissing y, uh, climate change? Well, I mean, so, so there were, no, but you look at the examples of, of the overspending in preparation of Y2K led to kind of uh, yeah, a lot of that. Not, yeah, so. Led to a lot of what? Led to the positive, There were positive externalities to that. Yeah. Right, if the argument is that all that sort of prep kind of led to a non-event, if we could do that this time, that would be really great, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, well, but but it's, that, that is hard to prove because some people say that all the prep was for naught, the thing wasn't going to really happen anyway. There's no, they can't be, they can't believe that the prep actually worked and prevented, you know, elevators from falling and airplanes from plummeting to the ground and, and whatever else is going to happen at Y2K. So, so that, that's why I like, I'm, ooh, the, the Y2K example for me is a little bit fraught. Sorry. I think, I mean, I'm just sort of, I think what I'm hearing Richard say, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that like if we can energize people to mobilize around this thing, then then with it with the best of luck, we'll have the same people being like, that didn't work. It wasn't going to be a big thing anyway, because we will have sorted it out. <laughs> so let's go to retirement homes and find the COBOL programmers who didn't want to pay originally and arm them with ways of fixing climate change. That is a, I love this idea. <laughs> For those of us who cherish such things, Y2K lives on in millennials, at least in my household, by reference to the days of the week. There's Sundak, Mundak, Tudak, Tuesday. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. And then, of course, the random... Um, the delightful emergence of a similar Y2K conversion, in other words, at other times. Oh my God. <laughs> I've never heard that before. How did I miss oh, that? Yeah, it's been, they've been doing it for years and, you know, all of our sort of, you know, the close-ins. It's, it's fabulous. That's hilarious. That's brilliant. Thank you. Right, and there are many other such Y2K. Uh, I imagine once you get into it, it gets really fun. Which you will, yeah, which you will, yeah, find delightful. I see Todd's yeah. already ready to lay it out. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kess, I agree. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Exactly. Um, any other thoughts? We, we're getting close to the end of our time. I have to jump off at the top of the hour to, to be on a different call. Um, but this conversation so far, where has it taken any of us that you'd like to put a different, uh, 
a different thought in the mix. Yeah, I, I was on the way to saying something about, um, I can't think of an action that I can take. I'm asking if others could suggest, what is the action that I would take today to affect this shift to people, to technology serving people? Like, what, what would I buy? What would I use? How would I change my... I, I don't have an answer to that. And I think that, you know, it's, it's in that place where you get out of the realm of ideology and spread of mm -hmm. ideas and you hook <clears throat> into something that Sorry. Makes, makes, the, makes the change. Um, I can offer a couple of personal observations. Um, oh, yay. I'm, getting a, I'm, I'm opening my notebook. Oh, goody. <laughs> Reopening um, my notebook. <laughs> So, so this past week in Copenhagen, they did the second annual tech festival. I was not there this, this year, but I was there last year when we co-wrote something called the, the, the Copenhagen Letter on Technology, which was a manifesto, and there are many. I can show you the, the, the place in my brain where I collect manifesti, and there's a lot of them. But, Please but, do. But, but it was an attempt, um, let me see. Shoot, I thought I had a keyboard shortcut for it, but I don't. Um, but it was an attempt to, to put into words, hey, hey, people, wake up, this is what's going on. Um, one of the things I've realized but I haven't done much about is that most programmers who are out there in businesses are being asked to violate the stock or serve line all the time every day. They just don't know it. So they're, they're busy sort of engaged in a moral choice that they're unaware of. So raising that awareness, and, and Googlers are doing this a lot for Google with, you know, hey, Google, you're not going to get to go to China and, and, uh, and compromise Google values for, in order to enter the Chinese market. We won't let you, we employees. So I think, I think arming the people who actually do the coding with some insight and a bit, of, a bit of awareness of how to make the distinction, and then some tools for enacting that, like collecting up together, finding other people of like mind so that management can find out, hey, wait a minute. A third of our coders are really pissed off about this and are you know going to protest or leave or, or do whatever i think that would be really good um and then i think we're just beginning to understand how all this stuff plays out for humans uh, the whole facebook plus cambridge analytica plus russians buying ads plus election and all that 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 kind of splashed it pretty big on the screen but didn't give enough depth and chasing us out of cuba don't forget that yeah there's that too um, so, so I think uh, one of the problems with technology is that our, there's a really long lag period between when we implement technology and it eats the world, and then when we realize what the hell we did, what we did and the effects it had. Uh, my favorite passage on this is uh, uh, gerrymander in, uh, about cars in, uh, in the absence of the sacred. He has a whole page about, how, would we have let the car move forward if we had known that we were going to pave over all our cities? Uh, you know, uh, prejudice pedestrians against, you know, cars, uh, fight wars over the natural resources, pollute our sky, would we have, and it's a rhetorical question, because the car did what the car did, and it's all, who knows if it could have the been car painful. didn't do anything, we did. We, we, we did stuff with the car. Well, you know, there's a really interesting argument that corn is actually a human virus for its own propagation, that it's a little bit like the, the taxoplasmosis uh, with, with uh, mice, <clears throat> that, that or whatever it is that makes mice sort of lose their fear of cats and become good victims, that corn basically invaded humans and so that it could replicate itself endlessly across the earth. And that it's- is sap That's in Sapien. <laughs> Sapien says the same thing about wheat. So. Yeah, okay. Uh, pick, your, pick your crop that sort of squished itself all over earth. Um, so, so that's one take. Anybody else? I have one, one, one thought. I was going to go back to something, SD, that you said, which was about, um, you know, this whole, or actually the discussion about serve, serve and... Uh, Stalker serve? And stalking, that one. I, I think that if you steep yourself in service thinking for a while, you become allergic to uh, delivery, phrases like delivering service, or providing service or anything else. It's the value of the interaction with the thing that's co-creating value, right? 
And I just, I just think that's a bigger fact than we're giving room for. That is, if we're going to design our tools so that we work with them and not, and not just you know, automate our work and not just augment, although those are perfectly fine things to do, but once we have tools with technology with agency, which we now have, we have to find a way to interact with them in real time so that, so that we can have some, well, involvement, engagement. <laughs> I don't want to go as far as control, but we, we've, we've let a lot, of, a lot of stuff go. Agreed. Interesting to me how hard it feels to uh, talk to people in, in terms of when we talk to members about, you know, one, one way to get this done is to actually have a conversation with the people who might be interested in purchasing this service or product or whatever it is, the pushback. And I feel it too, right? Like, Oh, we could go ask some members about how they feel about this X, Y, Z. And I'm like, Oh, I don't want to bother the members. I don't know. I don't right? Oh, like, yeah, but this has been going on. So for so long, I mean, it really for sure. So, well, so the question is, how do we help each other get over the the fear of talking to each other? And where do we start on this sort of like, because because if I, so this kind of goes back to Todd's startup thing too, right? Where in which people are pitching a bunch of things that perhaps nobody wants or needs. Like how, how do you, how do you seed trust so that, that any conversation you have about what what might you be interested in, what would be interesting, um, is is heard from a place of oh you're actually interested in in serving me or being helpful to me as opposed to oh all you want to do is mine my ideas and then sell them for money or all you want to do is have me tell you how to sell me more things I guess right in the in the case of talking to our uh, companies talking to their their customers who in many cases are their biggest fans right that's the whole sort of like if someone asks me that I know and like for my advice I'm like Yes, I would love to give that to you, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not what it feels like when you have to go out and ask. I, and I don't know what what the issue is there, or it, it, but it feels fairly universal. I mean, yeah, no, it's sort of interesting because it strikes me that part of this is is it worth my time? Mm. You know, and if we, you know, what do we do to make it? I mean, this is this goes to worth and value, right? It's the, <laughs> you know, you're you're sort of on the on the what's it worth? what's it worth to this person, right? And, and that's a different conversation than, than even the, the co-creation of value one. And I think worth is both money and time. I mean, it's pretty basic. There's also, you know, oh. go ahead, Essie. So one of the few great things about Steve Jobs, right, was his, insistence and therefore his installation in my brain at least if from like somewhere in the 80s as the customers can't tell you any anything interesting about what they don't have right mm. and right uh, I, and i can't right and the only way i can can get anywhere with that question is to start getting into the create or you know it's in some mode of, of myself anyway so so one of those things is to have it is to have those conversations right in some place that starts respecting that if i don't have it yet i can't know it right and then don't make me figure out who I am to you and what part of your purchase cycle, right? In order to have this conversation, those are both, right? Mm -hmm. the, the things that I think genuinely, it's not about getting into the conversation. It's like what happens on the second sheet of, <laughs> of, of the question guide or something like that, right? right? Or the first conversation has to be like, what are your actual pain points? Tell me about yeah, your day right. and what parts right. suck. Like, what right. can I do to make that better? Mm -hmm. Right. And well, even that pain, that's asking someone to have analyzed it. It's so true. Right. You right. know, I mean, yeah. So, and, and, yeah. and there's some, you know, there's some gold and some magic in this notion of what's the actual service in which this product that you represent is playing, is playing mm -hmm. some role, mm -hmm. right? And um, 
I know I feel like Jerry was Nervous thinking would say that that's probably not quite the right question. Well, I think that when you have the vision of what that is, right, you have you something. Being, you being the proposer? Both sides, right. Um, you're, you're talking for real. So Jerry, that day when we were, that, the time when we were doing stuff about health and we had people, right, I, I carried around your picture, right? Um, when we were doing B a while ago, like mm -hmm. ways of getting into how do you, how do you take care of yourself? Like, and who does it with you? Which, which was very far away, yeah. right? Ended up with, I think, I felt like each of us walked away with, and then the small groups that met, some sort of, some image that was help, right? Anyway, um, which I think is a service, right? I think does, um, I, Susan, I think you were pointing to this when you said service thinking on some level. Anyway, I'm going, I'm taking us over time and, well, that's and okay. no, place it's, it. It's gotten really fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, I've got to actually scoot. Um, just a, a brief note. Um, a, <clears throat> the, a, a piece of our conversation here is actually really informative for this whole design from trust thing that I'm working on. And I think that, ooh, I think my computer's freezing. There we go. Um, and I think that um, design thinking tries to get feet on the ground to listen with care and observe and have empathy, but it taps out at some point in the middle of the conversation yeah. we're having. And the design from trust that I'm trying to create tries to go bigger picture and see more of what somebody might want to use, but then involve them in the creation of it. And in the middle of that is the, no, 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 this is impossible. I couldn't want it if you built it for me. But then when they have it, they love it. And like, oh my God, this is in fact what I wanted to use. So that little, that little gap is a chasm that many good <laughs> ideas fall into until the time shows up that somebody actually makes it happen and boom, it, then it's there. So that said, I'm, I, must, uh, I must bid my adieu until next uh, month, but I'm, we're gonna have some pop-up calls pop up shortly. I have a couple I'll put on our schedule about design from trust. Todd is going to invite us all to a couple conversations and thank you all for being here, like from the depths of my tiny little heart. Thanks, great to see bye -bye. you all, bye. Thanks guys, bye-bye. Bye-bye.